Thank you very much for this kind and uh, prolonged introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm very proud to be here in uh, such a good company of colleagues and friends from abroad. Um, this is a very nice opportunity at the University Library today for uh, us librarians, for scientists from Serbia and the uh, audience, and uh, for those watching this uh, via live streaming. Uh, okay, so um, my presentation is entitled uh, Open Science, the Remedy for a Post-Truth post World. So um, I won't be having um, um, much of um, um, thing to say besides one argumentation line. So bear with me for this half an hour on this argumentation line. So why this topic? Because usually at the end in such opportunities, uh, local guy speaks. <laughs> so uh, I'd be rather talking about open science in Serbia, repositories, birds, bees, everything's nice. But uh, I have a feeling that someone has to address this topic further besides what we already heard um, with our previous speakers. Okay, so the question remains, why open science? So when I first started working at the library 15 years ago, um, they said they are ripping us off, the publishers, they are charging hilarious sums. And that was the rationale. And then the first thing coming to my mind, okay, tax, tax them, bring the money back to the budget. I mean, it's simple as that. And then, um, people say, well, there are, it's unfair, they're powerful, they're mighty publishers, um, cannot do that. But then, there is a remedy, antitrust law, law, as it is, some kind of remedy. And then, there are other rationales, we hear, we've heard a lot about those rationales today, and during previous um, events uh, addressing open science and um, open access. But everything about those rationales is mostly that they are 20th century rationales, industrial era rationales. And now we are in 2018, where those rationales are no longer holds. So we are in 2018, it's a golden age, somebody would say. Uh, there is a very nice uh, Twitter account, I suggest you look it up, uh, Human Progress. There you will find Marvel's statistics about how good we are. Uh, this is one basic statistic, like, uh, we are exponentially getting better, much richer, everything. So you can look at a lot of statistics, I won't bother you, how people are living longer in Ethiopia nowadays than they lived in Finland 50 years ago, etc., etc how they are more rich in, I know, some Asian, far away Asian country than in uh, whatever, France. So very nice statistics. But then if you, if, you, if you look out of the window, people are not really satisfied. This is a famous story of a Finland National Library, where they have a, a crowdsourced OCR uh, correction program. They asked people to correct their OCR newspapers, and it was going fantastic, like, like Marvel, a lot of people coming in and, and typing in and they say, let's make it even better, and they gamified it. And then the phone starts ringing, ringing and everybody is angry and they are saying on the phone, we're not doing for this for some stupid game, we're doing this for Finland. We don't want it to be better, it's good as it is. So basically, people are not very happy um, with our golden age. That's I think very common uh, on the streets. So the, the, the question remains, why open science in 2018? So first we need a rationale to find out the rationale why, why we are doing it. I mean, we are still doing it for 20th century reasons. They are still ripping us off and they are still mighty powerful publishers. But there are a lot of more rationale today because it's a new world. And then we don't know because we, we are not still, uh, still don't know about the rationale, so we don't know why open science. So let's try to answer the first question first. Rationale. So in order to answer this question, we have to look around and see what is 2018 looking like. 
Well, it looks like a tectonic shift. Digital technologies are moving power away from the center and to the edges and down. Um, this is a statement by somebody well acquainted with this power thing. Um, um, retired General Michael Hayden, former head of CIA and NSA, so he knows something about these things. And we know ourselves. 20 years ago, nobody could look at the uh, uh, satellite photos but two superpowers. Nowadays, everyone can look at the satellite photos and see what's going on in Northern Korea, whatever. So what are the consequences of, these, um, of this tectonic shifts? Well, first, institutions are eroding. And then there is no need for mediation. That's what we can see every day in media. Why would I need media if I can talk to you by Twitter directly? We still need some media, but mostly we don't need them. And then rock and roll, why would I need a band to translate the message to you? I can translate the message to you, I can record myself on YouTube, I don't need a band to do it for me. And then arts. And then arts. Maybe we need arts. But where is the public? Where is the audience? Who is the audience when everybody is an author? Is there an audience anymore? I'm not sure. Maybe there is. But everybody can be an author in half a second. And in the same line of thought, uh, we need scientific journals as we need media. Because if you think about it, scientific journals were kind of media. Like I'm uh, publicizing, publishing what I have find out. Why should I be needing this when I communicate directly with you? So that's a question. And then the, 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 those are questions that are not technological. And then there are technological questions, which we addressed in a paper here at the University Library. Um, can a scientific journal own itself? Well, there is a paper published by Springer, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> Uh, well, doesn't it? Uh, uh, it, it's based on a, a cryptocurrency thing. It's a paper that is, um, it's an idea proving that it can be, that it's feasible. Because if you're a program, you cannot go to a bank and uh, trade in euros or dollars, but you can trade in bitcoins online. So why not be economically self-sustained? and hire people to do editorial work and write for you and do other stuff that the scientific journal needs to do. So there are also technical issues. And then there are many, many issues today which we addressed. This is all six years ago. Uh, from the, the, this uh, slide is from the, uh, from the presentation of our uh, Dutch colleague, Bel Terop. Um, there's this issue of uh, um, impossibility of being an expert in a world where there are so many, so many, so many uh, articles published. And I, 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 I stole just one slide from him, I borrowed it. Uh, uh, just an example to show how it's an impossibility to be experts in echocardiography. Uh, because if you read all existing papers on this particular issue, it would take 11 years. And then meanwhile more papers would be issued. And then before catching up, <clears throat> you need to read more papers, and then you can go retire. So you can never know everything about it. You cannot even know 10%, maybe. Maybe 10% you can know about everything that is written about some specific area. So what is an expert? That's a viable question, 2018. What is an expert? OK, next question. Uh, ne ne next item. Don't race against the machine, 2018. 2012 also, uh, uh, if you look at machine, techno machine learning technology, um, you don't need jobs that, you, that it takes four years of higher education, because the machine can do it. You press a button and you get uh, opinion on a, from a, from a practitioner, doc doctor practitioner. If you need a specialist, then you go to him. Also, um, another issue from 2012. Um, 
the most well-read entity in the world. For six years, it's not a human. It's uh, IBM Dr. Watson computer, who won Jeopardy in 2012. Um, so it's not interesting anymore who is the most well-read person. It's a computer. Computer opening, you press a button, you get text like this, very structured text. This is the first one um, uh, published by Forbes in 2012. So those are all issues that we're dealing with today um, and that are making the framework for open science today. And then we have some other thoughts. We're, in Serbia we have a very entrepreneurial person who is a media mogul uh, and I write, wrote his name in Serbian Cyrillic to emphasize this and he says content is the king and in what's left of media that's probably true but then in science and other branches the context is the king I think because if you don't know the context you don't know what it is until you know what it is and then if the context is changed you can have things like this spread very fast through digital technologies and this is a very stupid example um, but as we will discuss further it may not be that stupid as it looks like and then we have much clever examples where people publish books and you are written on the pages as an author but you never heard of it because technology allows you to do it you can print a book in which Adam Sofronievich has written this or that and I don't even know that this book has been published and then if you think about people who are more important than me you can think that somebody would like to publish their books on certain issues and then you have um, this context where um, everything is really fast and just give me one sentence, I will explain everything to you in one sentence. <coughs> and then you have this context, where it's not the best who is first in the race. Neither human nor computer, but the best process win. This is example from World of Chess. But basically, um, what this quote says is, uh, you can win from your home with your smartphone if you communicate very good with, with your smartphone. You don't need a supercomputer. You don't need to be very smart. You just need to communicate very good with your computer helper. And then in all this context, you have things like that. This is a Serbian example. Um, with a very, very low-tech technology like paint. Anybody remembers paint in Windows? So you, 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 make, you make things like this. This is uh, um, uh, for our speakers. The, the, these pictures are very, very rude, um, very rude jokes um, playing on uh, culture icons of Serbian cultural heritage. So these pictures are very rude. And they have 300,000 people saying I like this on Facebook. So 300,000 people in Serbia, that's 10% of voting population. So if the elections were tomorrow, this would be the second largest party in Serbia. So the questions like this comes up again in another context. Questions that our colleague Yanis from Greece was mentioning that philosophers from Greece were thinking about 3,000 years ago. Uh, who is eligible to decide on the fate of the community? Is it the best, the smartest, or everybody? So who is eligible to do science? Who is eligible to do open science? So in this context, you have science nowadays. And if you look at the, another very interesting uh, Twitter account that is called Real Peer Review, you will find numerous examples um, on how science is doing nowadays. And this is uh, how open science works. If you look at the Twitter, you see this um, example. Somebody says, well, take a look at this article. 
This is really a peer-reviewed paper. I know. I don't know how much can you see back there. Um, the text maybe not a lot, but um, this read. This is a very ridiculous paper that was published by a um, very distinguished publisher, and um, it's completely ridiculous. And then you have this real peer review Twitter account that brings tens of those almost every day, like this one, where somebody is writing an article about his or hers um, body mass index and problem. I mean, it's completely unscientific. And then you have this, where somebody is explaining how you need to read an article in order to cite it. Well, that's a deep, really deep. So you can go on and on and on like this. It's not the problem um, that we have bad science and somebody is doing it badly and somebody is doing it good. And then we have another Twitter account, Retraction Watch. And there, a few days ago, you find a survey that more than 30% of research thought it's acceptable to cite a reference that you have not read. That's a um, phenomenon that is gaining a lot of popularity nowadays. Um, and we can ask ourselves, um, what is this open science thing good for if it just gives people titles to reference? Why do we need open access? Why? They don't need full paper. They need title. And on and on, Retraction Watch, you can read about a lot of stuff that's going on in science. But this is open science. We can know about it and deal with it, or we can think and pretend that this doesn't not happen. And on and on, Retraction Watch, etc. Um, yes, it's there's still time to show you one interesting video. I think it's four minutes. I think it will. It's a good example. Probably not, I guess. 
this? I mean, unless you haven't completed first day up to this point, and so you can do that now. If that's where you feel like mentally you, you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not in a great society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're six five. If you truly believe you're six five, I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. So you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone's wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I would just go like, oh, you're wrong, and it's wrong to believe it, because I think, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I could be a Chinese woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debate me or explain why you felt like you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be right to say that you're six foot five or Chinese or woman. It should be hard to tell a five nine white guy that he's not a six foot five Chinese woman. But clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? Okay, so this was six years ago, um, and um, this just a second, and the 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 okay, and this is today. It was two two days ago. Like the guy is asking the court to verify that he is not 69, but 49. Because he cannot get the loan, he cannot go that well on a dating site, but he cannot get the loan. If the court approves, he can get the loan from the bank, etc., etc. So, um, is there any truth out there left? I mean, the science was about truth in the beginning, and lately, but nowadays it seems that truth is very questionable category. Um, and there is a strain of thought in Western civilization coming from, I, I want to quote ancient <laughs> philosophers, but some more modern ones, like 15th century and 19th century. And then today we come to this, nothing is true and everything is possible. You can be 20 years younger, if you wish to be 20 years younger. That's what Pico della Mirandola said 500 years ago, basically. You can be everything that you want to be. But if you can be everything that you want to be, uh, what about other things? Is there a reason to study these things scientifically? Or we decide what those things are? So, in 2018, we have multiple truths. And if you remember what retired general Michael Hayden said, uh, our center has been moved towards many individuals. So there is not one institution anymore that can verify the truth or say, well, we did the proper scientific pro process and say this is it, this is white, it's not black. Now we have many individuals who say this is this shade of gray or that shade of gray. So we have decline of faith in institutions alongside this. This is another problem because technologies are telling us we can um, very quickly um, find out almost everything about everything. But about institutions, well, it's more difficult. 
So um, there is concern and doubts about the institutions. And then science comes to a slippery slope. Scientific process has become too complex and there are too many results. And the models that we use to digest these multiple results, like in media, they are not, or like in a library. Ten years ago, we were saying in libraries, well, I don't know nothing about that uh, area of expertise, let's use experts. Well, that's a shift from 20 years ago when a librarian would know a proper book. Um, so we come to a question, why open science in 2018? They're still trying to rip us off, but now they want to cancel the truth. Who are they? Well, the circumstances, technologies, people, I don't know, but somebody is trying to cancel the truth in 2018. So that's, a, in my mind, it's a bigger problem than some publisher wanting to rip me off. People want to rip me off, but I can deal with that with 20th century remedies. But for this, I need a new remedy. And that remedy can be open science, which can be, a, as you see, magnifying glass looking into a scientific process, very complex scientific process, very complex life that goes on around us. And if we use this magnifying glass, we can tell what is truth again. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So, what of open science? Well, certain infrastructures. We cannot do without them. But also communication. What would I need the infrastructure for if I don't have communication? It will be useless waste of effort. And then we need many other things in order to get to new models, concepts, frameworks that will answer questions that are reappearing in new contexts. Should women be allowed to vote? Should poor people be allowed to vote? Maybe not, maybe yes. We don't know the truth nowadays. If somebody claimed six years ago that he can be seven years old and now a guy is su suing for being 20 years older, 20 years younger, in six years somebody can say, well, well, those guys were poor, they are not worthy of voting. So, we need new models, concepts and frameworks to answer these questions. And now the final question, what is open science in 2025? Well, in my opinion, it's science, just science. No need to say open anymore. Or it will be again science, but nobody will speak about openness anymore because <laughs> it won't be viable in another context. I mean, um, in 2025 we won't have open anyways. It will be either open or not. So we will call it science. I either way in 2025. Okay, thank you. And uh, since the panel is coming up, maybe we can... All the questions can... Or now, whatever. Thank you very much. If there are any questions for Adam right now, we can address them. Please, we have a question um, over there. It's not a question, it's more like a comment. Um, if I followed you and understood you correctly, um, this is a pretty depressive picture of the science, let's say, or the status that the science is in. So, and I have to say that I actually disagree because um, I'm not saying that things are perfect and that things are moving as fast as we would like them to be. Um, but there are certain fields that are doing a lot and that has done a lot in the last couple of years to um, improve the quality of scientific data that has been published. And it's, it's actually, so you have new uh, forms of publishing, um, 
for example, I can, I can speak for um, psychology and one part of medicine, or at least the part of the medicine that I follow. So we've done a lot and it's not so, it's like the, there is no truth. So people are actually doing a lot to prove that their data and their findings are actually correct. So that's, that's my impression, so, or more than an impression, more like a fact, I don't know. Well, thank you. That's uh, certainly a true uh, impression, I think, because time is doing much better than in medicine. Um, but why I painted this maybe a grim picture? Because we really need open science to remedy this. Because otherwise, um, I, I had examples from STEM as well, uh, uh, where they do similar things, but very few examples at this point. Um, but if we don't turn the tide now with open science, uh, it will be very difficult in five years' time to say, uh, I did res this research and I'm saying to you that this cure is viable, etc., etc., and then somebody will say, well, I think it's not, because I think it's not. So I think we do need open science to remedy that.